fought by an infant navy. Let me ask you something. 1798 to 1805. Now, that seems mighty far away and long ago. Yes, it was. But these wars were proving grounds for the great fleets to come. They schooled commanders and their crews for future struggles and convinced the country that ocean commerce had to be protected by a navy. Let's go back to the year 1783. Well, another question. What was going on then? The British left New York at the end of the Revolution. The Treaty of Paris was signed. Eight years of struggle were over. American independence was won. In New York, Washington said farewell to his battle-tested officers. In Annapolis, he resigned his commission as Commander-in-Chief. He'd been first in war. And now he was first in peace and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Yes, he retired as a private citizen to farm his fields at Mount Vernon. Well, who are these folks here? A veteran's family. Home came the fighter, the soldier, and the sailor. Was that the size of our Navy? Not even one ship was left. Our victory over Britain appeared a hollow one. There was the weak central government. It had no power to tax. It relied on requests to the states. And with no common enemy to fight, the 13 states raised tax barriers, almost waged open war against each other. England refused to consider her former colonies as a truly independent nation. Foreign trade suffered. England, France, and Spain closed West Indian ports to United States ships. Unemployment followed debts. Veterans lost their homes and farms. Many sought new opportunities in the West. In 1786, in Massachusetts, revolt flared in Shea's Rebellion. Appears to me something had to be done. As a republic, we were mighty young and weak. And we didn't want to be begging England to take us back. No, the tide turned. In Philadelphia, in 1787, the Constitution was written. But tell me, why did the states wrestle about the Constitution? Well, you see, each was afraid it would sacrifice too much to a central government. But adoption of the Bill of Rights guaranteed personal liberty to every individual. In 1789, Washington became first president. And Hamilton, first secretary of the Treasury, established government credit. America was ready to take its place in the family of nations. Vermont, the 14th state, joined the new union in 1791. Kentucky in 1792. Tennessee in 1796. Yes, but why in thunderation did these 16 states go to fight a war with France? At Yorktown, she was our ally, our comrade in arms. It never was declared war, but there was shooting. In the year 1789, the French Revolution burst into flames. At first, all Americans sympathized. They thought the French, too, wished to be independent of a king. Louis XVI was beheaded. Then the bloody reign of terror. Too much blood. Too much terror. England and her allies in Europe went to war against France. Washington, hoping for peace, proclaimed our neutrality. I'll calculate the French didn't like that. They wanted help from us, figured we were still allies. The French sent over an agent named Janet. He violated American neutrality. He outfitted privateers, recruited seamen, even tried to turn the American people against Washington. In 1797, our president, John Adams, wished to effect some sort of a reconciliation. He sent emissaries to France, but they weren't well received. Representatives of the French government, known only as Messieurs X, Y, Z, demanded bribes before they would even discuss a treaty. We were badly treated on land and on sea. The violence of the French Revolution spread. French privateers swarmed through the West Indies and along our Atlantic coast. By June of 1797, 
over 300 American merchant vessels had been taken by the French. In 1798, Congress voted reprisals, which were later extended to include the capture of armed French vessels anywhere. That meant war. An undeclared war fought entirely on the seas. That calls for a navy somehow. Yes, six new frigates had already been authorized by Congress, four of 44 guns and two of 36 guns. A separate Department of the Navy was created in 1798. An energetic merchant and shipowner with vision was appointed the first Secretary of the Navy, Benjamin Stoddart. He worked hard to build a fleet and laid a firm foundation for the development of the Navy. By the end of 1799, 33 vessels were built or purchased, outfitted, and manned. Under the new Secretary of the Navy, the number of captains increased from three to 28, including Preble, Bainbridge, Rogers, Truxton. To build and maintain ships required shipyards, storehouses, materials, workmen near large cities. All kinds of seagoing men of war. What are these little critters? Well, generally, the small vessels of less than 20 guns were brigs or schooners, according to their rigs. Well, now, take these three-masted fellows. Uh, how do you call them? Up to 24 guns, a three-master was called a sloop of war. 24 to 50 or more guns on two decks were frigates. The frigates were the largest ships in the American Navy at that time. Warships reached their greatest power and efficiency operating in squadrons and fleets. Then they could penetrate blockades and drive lighter vessels from the seas. For the first time, American squadrons were assigned definite stations, convoying American merchant vessels and fighting the French wherever they went. The senior officer of the new United States Navy, Commodore John Berry of Revolutionary War fame, commanded the frigates United States and Constitution and eight smaller men of war. Commodore Truxton, in the Constellation and four lesser warcraft, cruised between St. Christopher and Puerto Rico. A third squadron was stationed in the Windward Passage between Cuba and Haiti under Commodore Tingey in the Ganges. And north of Cuba was Commodore Decatur Sr. in the Delaware and two revenue cutters, four runners of the United States Coast Guard. They held these stations when they were not home for repairs. They searched for privateers and escorted convoys of American merchant ships. 